the photocopier has become an indispensable part of any modern office. Every bit of paper that goes in and out of an office gets copied, usually more than once. The machines themselves remain rather mysterious black boxes and have an infuriating habit of going wrong just when you want to copy something in a hurry. In this programme, Rex and I are going to try and uh, demystify these ingenious but often infuriating machines. Before the photocopier was invented, there were many different methods of copying documents available, but they were all slow and inconvenient. Thermal machines from the 50s involved a complicated sequence of intermediate stages and only produced the final copies on special chemical paper. The most common way of making multiple copies was the duplicator, but the original had to be specially typed on a wax stencil. The typing perforated the wax, allowing the ink through onto the copies. The Victorians invented the copy book. The page was damped, so it absorbed some of the ink from the original when pressed against it. Copy books were still used for legal documents till the 1950s. But even before the copybook, a chemical process had been invented for copying engineering drawings. A mixture of these two chemicals is first uh, spread on a bit of paper. And then the drawing to be copied is uh, put on top. And this is now exposed to uh, a very bright light. Arc lights were often used, early electric arc lights like this. Well, anyway, this actually takes rather a long time, so um, I've done one already that I've prepared earlier. A bit like a cookery programme. Um, here it is. Well, it doesn't uh, look very promising, but if I now spread it another chemical on it, so the image should start to appear. Just have to wash the chemicals all off now. And a dye, Prussian blue, is left impregnated into the paper on the bits which have been exposed to the light. Well, the process has actually been obsolete for over 50 years now, but the word blueprint has become stuck in the language. Wet chemical systems were also developed for the office. Two minutes is the time needed to deliver the print, and she'll get not a negative with all blacks and whites reversed, but a direct copy of the original. That's positive. No trays to bother about either. She just brushes on the developer, then watches while the picture appears. Fixed in much the same way, the copy is now squeezed dry. It's just too bad that the outfit doesn't include properly watermarked paper for copying banknotes. The idea that revolutionized copying came from an unassuming American patent lawyer called Chester Carlson. Well, in the course of my uh, patent work, I frequently had need for uh, copies of patent specifications and drawings, and there was no really convenient way of uh, getting them at that time. Carlson started experimenting with a copying process based on the ancient but unpredictable science of static electricity. Use. The lamp is dusty us. Boys! Oh, oh, yes, master! Yes, Polish well and the lamps. Rub harder, agents. The ancient Greeks first noticed static electricity when they observed that lamps made of amber attracted dust after being rubbed. Preposterous! The lamp is dusty us! But, 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 but we... Get outside while I administer oh. the usual. Our word for electricity comes from the Greek for amber, electron. The Greeks also had trouble with their spinning wheels because the bearings were made of amber. Modern plastics like nylon carpets and synthetic shoe soles work much better than amber. I'm now charging myself up and uh, it's called static electricity because the electricity is literally static. It's trapped inside me and I'll stay charged up until I discharge myself by holding my 
finger near something that's earth, I might be able to make a tiny spark and give myself a tiny electric shock. This, no, nothing. Um, <clears throat> the static electricity experiments uh, only really work when uh, the air is very dry, and in any case, they seem to be incredibly unpredictable. I hope uh, these work better. Um, if I charge up this bit of plastic, I should be able to make some bits of uh, tin foil dance around. Oh yes, that, that's not working too badly. Um, static electricity can also make uh, dust fly up and stick to things. Pull some dust on there. Yes. It's this effect of attracting small particles that's used in the photocopier. Carlson did his early experiments in his kitchen. In fact, we found the only place we could reliably repeat them was in Rex's kitchen, because he's got underfloor central heating, and so it's uh, extremely dry. It's going to work all right. Oh, I think so. Car yeah, Carlson right. started by casting blocks of sulphur after reading that uh, sulphur lost its electrostatic charge when it was um, exposed to, to bright light. Um, yeah, it does look good. It's not easy casting these plates of sulphur, and it makes an awful smell as well. Um, well, we've got to leave that one to cool, haven't we? Yes. So uh, perhaps we'd better try it with uh, one of the other ones. What Carlson did was to charge the, the plates up by rubbing them. So now we have to put some sort of an, an, an image on top of it. That's it. And now we'll expose it. OK. The sulphur is now losing its electrostatic charge as it's exposed to the light. So it's now only the areas under the black letters, protected from the light, that are still charged. If a fine powder is now dusted over the surface, Carlson used like a podium, it will be attracted only to the charged parts revealing the image. There's an A. Oh, yes, coming, out yeah, quite good. coming out quite well. It's a Although our result isn't very impressive, Carlson himself didn't do much better. No one was very impressed at the time, October the 22nd, 1938, but he somehow managed to persuade a research institute to try and develop his idea. The Patel Institute replaced Carlson sulphur with plates made by vacuum depositing thin layers of selenium. In the late 40s, in conjunction with a small company called Haloid, the first electrostatic copiers appeared, including one model called the 1385. This is one of the few surviving 1385s in Britain, and uh, it's a magnificent contraption. Um, it's all entirely manually operated, and it takes several minutes to make a copy. It doesn't look anything like Carlson's equipment, but it actually goes through exactly the same stages. Uh, this is the plate, and the first stage is to charge it up. So it goes in this slot here. Simply have to press the button. Patel had replaced Carlson's sulphur with a thin glassy layer of selenium that's so sensitive to light that I can only show you how it works in a dark room. Instead of rubbing it to charge it, Patel used a very, very fine high voltage wire that's inside this casing, and they simply moved it slowly across the plate. This gives it a very even charge, and uh, this is what's happening inside the slot in the 1385. Uh, the next stage is to expose it, and so take it over to this camera here, um, slips in the back. And this is the image I'm going to expose. It's basically just an old-fashioned plate camera, this. That's it. Put the slide back in. And the next stage is developing it. And that happens in, in here. Uh, put the plate in here. Pull the slide out again. This reminds me of some sort of magician's cabinet. Inside, a mixture of sand and toner powder, the equivalent of Carlson's lycopodium, like runs over the plate. It's only attracted to the parts of the plate that are still charged. That's the dark parts of the image. And we should now be left with uh, an image on the plate. Yes. Having a 
lot of trouble getting it as good as that. The copy paper is then put over the plate so the image can be transferred. The corona wire now charges the paper, transferring the toner powder onto it. Finally, the toner powder on the copy has to be heated to fix it. Probably about done now. Uh, yes, that's fixed. And that's the final copy. Well, this pr process is uh, obviously rather impractical for an office, but it found one specialist use for printers for making short-run printing plates. That's why I'm in a printer's now. Uh, I'm going to go away to try and print it. Here's the plate. The 1385 already embodied the same basic technology as today's copiers, but it still wasn't the machine of Carlson's dreams. The idea of uh, developing an office copier, which had never been uh, done before, and I thought of a machine that could uh, be uh, set on a desk in an office to which one could uh, bring an original to be copied and uh, uh, put it in the machine and push a button and get a copy out. His dream finally came true in 1959. The Haloid Company had changed its name to Xerox and introduced the model 914. I can't type. I don't take dictation. I won't sharpen pencil. I can't file. My boss calls me indispensable. Miss Jones. Just a minute. Will you make a copy of this? Naturally. I pushed the button on the Xerox 914. I make perfect copies of whatever my boss needs by just turning a knob and pushing a button. Anything he can see, I can copy in black and white on ordinary paper. And am I fast? I can make seven copies a minute. By the way, I never need wet chemicals. My 914 is a dry machine powder dry. Sometimes my boss asks me which is the original, and sometimes I don't know. Here, Mr. Smith, I'm going to lunch with Mother. Easy there. Easy there. Hello. Here's your Xerox 914, ma'am. Oh, great. I reckon boss it'll have to go through the window. Although large and cumbersome, the machine revolutionized office copying. Oh, I just love pressing the button. Copy after copy. Mm, they keep coming. The key to automating the process was to change the exposure stage. In the uh, 1385, the camera lit the whole of the original and exposed it through the lens onto uh, the selenium plate. In automatic machines, the selenium plate was wrapped round, is wrapped round into a drum. The light is then enclosed in a box so that it only lights a thin strip of the original at a time. So now, um, if uh, we slowly move the original over the light, or the light over the original, while the drum rotates, it's exposed a bit at a time. It can then all become a continuous process. While one bit of the drum is being charged up, another is being exposed. Another is being developed with toner powder, and yet another is transferring its toner to the copy. The advantage of the drum is that all the stages of the process can be arranged around it. The charging stage is a fine wire, fine corona wire, just like in the original manual machines. I think this machine's a bit on its last legs. Um, the exposing stage is like, it's just like my model. 
the original goes on the top here, and then uh, the bright light moves across it, and the image is exposed by a couple of mirrors through the lens and onto the drum. Then the developing stage is in here. It's a bit difficult to get at, so I've got another developer unit here. The toner is actually mixed with uh, iron powder, and it sticks to this magnetic roller. As this rotates, it spreads the toner powder onto the drum. The copy paper comes along the bottom of the machine, comes in through, through this end, along here, and uh, there's another corona wire in the bottom here that attracts the toner from the drum onto the copy. Of course, when it, when it first uh, gets transferred onto the copy, it's still just uh, a powder. But the toner is mixed with a plastic that, uh, that melts at quite a low temperature when it's, um, when it's heated up a bit. In the, in the copier, there are a pair of uh, heated rollers. You can see the element, it switches on every now and then, and the copy goes between the two of them. This is what you have to wait for to warm up when you first switch the machine on. In the back, there's a mass of machinery, gears and cogs and things, both to pull the light across the original and to pull the copy paper through the machine. But despite all this complexity, copiers have progressively got cheaper and cheaper and smaller and smaller. The Japanese also made colour copying popular. The machine is extremely complicated, but the basic idea is really quite simple. At the back, there are four magnetic rollers with different colour toner on. This is the magenta, cyan blue, yellow and black, the same colours as in colour printing. And the bit of paper just goes through the machine four times, once for each colour. You should be able to see the different colours appearing on the drum, one after another, by looking in here. First it's exposed through a magenta filter and deposits the magenta toner, then the blue, then the yellow, and uh, finally the black, before it uh, comes out uh, the slot at the end of the machine. For photographic reproduction, the toner powder is much finer than in an ordinary copier, enabling subtle gradations in each colour. The fixing stage melts the four layers of toner powder together, creating the final true colours. Despite their sophistication, modern copiers still have their drawbacks. For a start, the static electricity creates a certain amount of ozone, which isn't very good for people. Large copiers are now fitted with carbon filters, and the static can have the effect of attracting dust inside the machine. This coats the rollers and the corona wires and the optics, producing worse and worse copies. Uh, this one's jammed up again. Not a very brilliant copy. The static also attracts the toner powder, which is terribly messy stuff deliberately designed to melt and congeal on everything it touches. This is basically what makes copiers still so heavily dependent on regular maintenance and servicing. Small copiers are now often made with disposable cartridges. Um, these not only contain the toner, they contain everything, including the drum. And the idea is that when the toner runs out, uh, it all gets replaced before it has a chance to get dirty. Then there are problems with the paper. Uh, paper tends to shrink as it dries out, just like wood. And uh, 
often inside the machine it distorts and jams up. And even without shrinkage, it's impossible to design a paper handling system that's uh, totally reliable. The best that manufacturers can do is to make the machine quite easy to rescue the mess. But with all these problems, it's really a miracle that copiers work at all. It's partly because of their temperamental quality that copiers are so often the focal point of the office. Oops. I've got a million and one things to write today. Oh, it's up to its tricks again. Polly, can you sort this out for me? I need 50 copies. Oh, I hate this machine. It's always going wrong. Oh, Brian, get lost. Oh, I see Jones's promotion isn't on the cards. What's up, Bob? I can't get it to work, Terry. What's wrong? Oh, it, it needs paper. Oh, no. The paper's jammed. Oh, I think it needs toner. It needs an expert. Oh, not again. Oh, dear. What is the hold-up? If you want a job done properly, do it yourself. Uh, when's it going to be fixed? Oh, needs new corona wires tomorrow, if you're lucky. Oh, dear. They won't let us use this one. Oh, this one. one's broken as well. There's a big queue here. It's only 50 copies. There's no need to be so rude. The unreliability of copiers leads to many of them being thrown out in disgust, which is great for me and Rex because we both find the parts very useful. The general has bearings, micro switches, and a solenoid taken out of an old copier. Almost everything I make has some bit of an old copier inside. Rex recently used the high voltage supply from a copier in an enormous static electricity machine. This weird looking contraption behind me is a Van de Graaff generator. I built it to explain the principles of electrostatics. Static electricity has got some spectacular effects. Ten years ago, there were a lot of predictions about the paperless office. Computer memories were going to completely replace files of paper, and there'd never be any need to print anything out or copy anything. This doesn't seem to have happened, though. More and more copiers get sold every year, and more and more paper gets used making copies. This isn't very ecologically sound, although at least some paper like this is now recycled. However, I find copiers much the most useful of all office machines and I'd be very sad to be without one.